Hello everyone and welcome back. We have a fun one for you today. So this case was one that was sent over by a great dentist. He had actually started the root canal, really deep carries on this one. Um, you can see there's a little bit of material in the distal, I'm pretty sure it's just calcium hydroxide and IRM on top of the tooth. Looking at it, I know there is a little finding on 29. It's asymptomatic at this point, so we'll just continue to monitor it. And there's my favorite nemesis in the world. IRM. <laughs> so we're going to show you how we take care of this tooth. I did a little bit something interesting with the access, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But start off as we always do by taking the tooth out of the bite. Um, with this one, the clinic that they work at, they are a little bit behind as far as crowns, so I'm actually being a little more aggressive here with the occlusal reduction. I do anticipate that we will have some eruption because they're about two, three months out right now as far as getting crowns done for their patients. So I kind of base how much I do on where they're uh, coming from and what the you know, situation is. Um, I'm actually trying in DaVinci, I try to do a, a stabilization feature. So if you see some weird ripples, um, it's supposed to make a difference. Um, it took a lot of time. So let me know if you love it or hate it. <laughs> but you can see that like right there, there's a pretty good ripple in that area. But um, when it's actually working, it does seem to make a significant difference. I have a few uh, videos later on in this video or clips that are not stabilized. So you will, you'll be able to see the difference here. What I was trying to do in that case was get that cleaned out and get the um, get the IRM out of the way. And now I'm gonna be doing the truss access. So that arrow is kind of where I'm looking towards. If I were to extend it all the way over to the mesial, I would be making a huge hole inside this tooth. So sometimes it's better to drill two holes. And that's what we're doing here. I'm gonna be using that skinny diamond that we like. And what you can do is look at the bite wing or the PA x-ray to kind of draw that line, like that arrow that I just showed and figure out where best to access. In this case, his uh, mesial canals were right below the extent of where that IRM was. So I kind of have a landmark. It's a little harder to do uh, truss accesses in crowns because you lose a lot of the anatomy, but on a natural tooth structure, especially with deep decay on the distal, this is a great way to do it. One tip I can give you is to, usually you want to go more to the mesial than you would think. The reason why is by the time you open it, most most mesial uh, canals, they curve back towards the distal at the most coronal part, but by the time you open it up with a 2006, that curve is gone and it's actually more to the mesial. So you don't want to go too far in either direction, but if I can give you a tip, if you're trying these out for the first time, that would be the recommendation is go a little bit more towards the mesial. Um, I was able to get into one, need to grab the other one here, and then just kind of go back and forth. Some people will actually do two single holes for MBML. I find that the mid mesial is a lot more prevalent than you think. There's actually a tiny, tiny little one here. It, it didn't go into anything, but I still like to clean that out. That I think it's worth it to go ahead and clean out the entirety of that area. You just kind of trough from buckle to lingual. And that's kind of what it looks like here. So I know it seems as though I'm too far to the mesial. You'll see once we've got everything cleaned out and once the final x-ray, that is actually where you want to be. Um, so still within the dentin, close to the enamel area there. Um, I know it looks like you're, it, I almost, you know, made the access a little too far to the mesial, but you'll see once you open this up, it actually lines up really nicely. So um, opening this up here with a 17, a little calcification on this one. So I want to make it a little easier for me to get my working length, but we're doing the same thing as normal for the rest of the tooth. Now the question's going to come up, what about the area in between? So the term, I think Michael Trudeau may have been the one to coin it. Um, I don't want to speak out of term, but it's certainly not mine. This would be the truss style access. And so for an access like this, uh, there is that tissue underneath the truss, kind of think of like a bridge. And when that happens, there might still be material in there. I don't care. I've never seen a case where it's failed because there's a small amount of pulp tissue remaining underneath there. There are some ultrasonics you can do. We're rinsing with, you know, a bleach and the Triton and everything and trying to get it as clean as possible. And I'm restoring it. So if there is anything, it should be entombed inside there. It isn't going to cause an issue. If I ever see a failure of a truss because of that, I will totally post it and own up to it, but not really worried about it. You'll notice I used the block up material here with that deep, deep distal decay. The chance of leakage is just like 100% at this point. So uh, to make my assistant's life a little bit easier, <laughs> I decided to go ahead and put that in there so we don't have to worry about the suction. Generally, if the decay is on the mesial or especially on the buckle, the assistant's able to get that pretty straightforward and not have to use this material because it does add to the cost. Not not significantly, but it does add to the cost of you know doing business. But for something like this, you, patient experience is my number one goal. And I, anytime you taste bleach, it's not a good experience. So. 
At this point, um, four canals, getting those cleaned out. Gonna go ahead and do our working length here. Um, I think we are. You can see that stabilization kind of coming in there. Uh, yeah, this rippling effect, I, I'm not, still not sure if I like it or not. Uh, let me know uh, if you guys hate it or if you love it or if you don't care or if you even made it this far in the video. So I'm going to dry everything off. Um, I did put a little too much block out on the distal there, so you'll see me cut that off in a minute. But we're going to go ahead and do our working length here, just like normal with the 10K file down to the bottom. Um, on this one, I did have a little bit of struggle getting all the way down to the bottom, so I'll actually check it here in a little bit. But the mesials look good getting those cleaned out um, once again I, I, I kept the whole working length one in this one because I was able to keep the video relatively short that 20 minutes seemed to be the most ideal um, treatment time on this case was probably 25 uh, from start to finish not including anesthesia uh, so it's I didn't cut out too too much as far as this case um, but yeah working down to the bottom just like we normally do uh, once again go down all the way to the zero zero point that's what I like to shape to uh, there's been some pretty good studies that that halfback is not accurate no matter who the company is. <laughs> they will tell you otherwise, but if you actually look at independent testing, uh, it's, it's yeah. Um, and you'll see me here try to get into these distals. I, I kind of can, but unfortunately, there's a little bit of block out in my way, and that's why we're so short here. I was also getting the out the apex reading because there was some leakage, so you can always just dry it, go in with the air only, and try to get in there. Um, you can see I'm way short of where the mesials are in this case trying to move it down and unfortunately the block out it was just in the way so what you'll see me do here in a second is just remove a little bit more of the block out so right there I'm gonna take that little skinny diamond and just go in and cut it back this is actually a good way to you can actually use the block out resin as a almost as a barrier if you're doing restorative um, kind of a cool technique there uh, it was a there's a little bit of a calcification at the apex as well had a trouble getting down with the 10 also my 10 was bent like crazy so ended up getting length here with the eight um, and I skipped over the other distal you, you get the idea so taking these down here now with the 17 um, getting this all cleaned out uh, it's pretty straightforward, kind of what we do from here on out. Um, nothing really special you need to do. I did want to double check the length here with that rotary. Um, sometimes you'll find you can't pull it back without spinning it. And so that's what we're doing here is getting in there and spinning it to get that accurate length. Unfortunately, we had a little bit of leakage on this one as well. So ended up finally getting a nice repeatable working length here as well, eventually and <laughs> got everything looking good. And there we are getting the other distal. So. Um, at this point, going to do the mesials here, just like you've seen me do in the past. Um, nothing too extravagant. This was a type 2 system. I'm very pleased with the final x-ray on this one. I'll show you that here in a few minutes. I uh, get this all taken care of. So I'm going to do the final rinse process here. Triton, get that all cleaned out. Um, you'll notice I'm not really too concerned about, once again, not concerned about that tissue underneath the truss. Um, th there are, EIE does make some ultrasonics that are curved that you can use to kind of clean out underneath there, but the whole point of doing an access this way is to conserve as much tooth structure as possible. You know, you look back at that x-ray and imagine if I had to connect the distal to the mesial, I would have a massive hole inside this tooth. And because the existing occlusal restoration was so thick, thin it was only maybe a millimeter deep especially by the time I took it out of the bite you still have this big wall of dentin inside there and I want to keep that if at all possible um, going in now with the activator like you've seen me do in the past just get everything cleaned um, decent amount of bubbling up tells me there's still a little bit of activity so we'll rinse that out until we don't see any bubbles anymore that's kind of my end point as far as getting everything you know ready to uh, seal up so yeah I don't have much more to say at this point. You guys have seen this a lot of times. <laughs> so just going through and rinsing it all out. And uh, we'll get ready to fill this up. Going to use the squirt technique on this one like we have in the past. Uh, you'll see there's a little bit of adjustment I have to do as well. So going inside, suctioning everything out. Going to get it nice and dry. One thing that I do like with this uh, technique as far as the truss is people will often complain with the minimally invasive endo that, oh, you can't see all of the canals because it was written in a book by somebody 30 years ago. Apparently, you have to see every canal at the same time using the mirror. Well, the beautiful thing is I drilled two straight lines. <laughs> and so you actually can see all four canals at the same time you'll see that I don't know if the photo with the open canals is as obvious but with the gutta percha you can see all four which is kind of cool um, so getting everything nice and dry here getting ready to take that photo um, and yeah really the the whole concept of straight line access 
it was a great idea when it came out. And just as a reminder, the reason why we needed to do straight line access is because we didn't have, especially back in the 60s, there was nickel titanium wasn't even a thing. So you're doing everything by hand. You're using pizzas, you're using gates. Uh, I don't even own pizzas or gates anymore. Like there's, there's really no use for them in a modern endodontic practice. And so that's what it looks like there as far as your mesials and distals. I guess you kind of can see all four. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the older endodontist might be balking at this, but that's okay. Um, going back in now for the squirt technique, getting everything sealed up here. And anyway, just as I was saying, the, the whole idea of straight line access is because the files couldn't bend. So now that we have these great files that are flexible and they're designed to go around corners, you don't have to do a straight line access. If you are in dental school right now watching this and you have a head of endo who disagrees with me, please don't send them <laughs> nasty messages and make them have to talk to me. Um, just do what you have to do to get through dental school and we can, we'll, we'll talk once you get done. <laughs> um, so square technique, sealing everything up as normal with my little beta um, going in. I uh, cut out a little bit here. We I did the first little bit. That's why you saw some get a Persia inside there, but unfortunately it was actually empty. So we had to refill it. So no need to have you guys sit around watching me refill a um, beta unit, obviously. <laughs> so with this, um, just going through, I, I didn't really notice that it was a type two until we took the final x-ray. Um, and that sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's, you know, you put the suction in and it clearly drains out the other one. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, you can use paper points, but really it doesn't affect too, too much as far as your obturation technique with a squirt. If you have the right technique and kind of do everything as you should, it generally doesn't cause too many issues and you can always pull it out and put a cone if you need to. So I think I have a case coming up soon that shows the you know, traditional kind of down pack with warm vertical, but um, yeah, so look forward to that if you care. <laughs> but uh, just sealing everything up here, uh, like we've talked about, um, not too, too bad. When it's this deep, this is, uh, it, it does add to the complexity. You can see how far zoomed in we are here. The two distals do join, and so I was able to just fill one and kind of take care of it. You'll notice I'm kind of flipping back and forth between the two distals as well, and that's just because when you push on one, it kind of pushes up the other. So you kind of want to go back and forth to make sure you get a really nice obturation, and you'll see me there backfilling that little hole as well in the distal lingual. Um, that the stabilization does kind of get me there, <laughs> the zoom in and out. So I'm not sure if I like this or not. It, it added a lot of time to my processing for it, but it was, you know, something to play around. Like I'm trying to do every time, uh, every time I make a new video, I'm trying to learn something new in DaVinci. That's my, my goal is to try to, you know, change it up. So what we're going to do now is get ready to, uh, take a final film or picture, kind of get everything up. You'll notice I'm actually popping off the block out right now. And that's because I don't need it there when I'm doing the actual buildup. So I was able to get a little bit of it off. I'm going to get the rest off here with a cotton pellet. Generally, you can either use the little condenser on um, the back end. That's not flexible. That will sometimes pop it off. Or in this case, I'm just using the wet cotton pellet. You can see me to pop all that off. This assistant will then be able to suction all those big pieces out. So when you do your restorative, you save time and don't have to worry about, you know, removing anything ex uh, extra here. So at this point, that's what it looks like. There is a void right where the, the type two joints. So we're gonna go ahead and fix that. This is what the Pac Mac was designed for. Go back in just kind of gently. You don't have to push very hard on this whatsoever. I'm only going in maybe six, seven millimeters. And then once again, when you pull that out, you want to brush against the wall. If you pull straight out, it's going to rip all the gutta percha out with it and create a huge void. If you gently kind of brush it against the wall, it almost like pulls the gutta percha off the Pac Mac flutes as you're pulling it. It, it it's a pretty interesting feeling so if you've tried the pack back in the past and hated it this would be what i'd recommend to it is worth i i hated it when i first used it so i would recommend going back and trying it again because it is a very useful tool for voids like this that one's high up enough i didn't take another check film i'm highly confident in its ability to do it now i did notice those distals were a little bit sloppy so i just went in here with the 850 to clean that up this is sacrilege to a lot of people of uh, using a burr to clean up gutta percha. If you've never done it before, be very, very careful. You can gouge it, but if you are careful with it, it does leave a beautiful flat surface. So that's one thing I will say. I, I don't do it all the time, but sometimes it is a very nice technique. Um, so we're gonna start our restorative process here. Same thing we've done in the past. Go ahead and use the BioClear Disclosing Solution to figure out where everything is. And at this point, I noticed there's still a little piece of amalgam in that little buckle pit. So I'm gonna go in here and quick zap that just with the diamond, just to knock that piece out, because no need to leave a little piece of metal in there. It's All this is gonna get prepped out when they, they 
patient gets a crown anyway, so it's not like it's a huge deal, but I like to make my x-rays look as good as possible, and you really don't want to have that mixed amalgam composite look going on here. So um, this is one I was surprised. What, the last time we talked about the IRM causing a lot of uh, inflammation, it, this or a lot of bacteria, this one didn't seem to do it. That quick thing you just saw there was me going in and uh, using my alpha tip to slightly cut the rubber dam. So the rubber dam is because it was so deep on the distal, the rubber dam had pushed into my way and I wasn't going to be able to get composite in there. So what I ended up doing was using the heated tip and you can use that to almost melt the rubber dam back just a little bit. It's not going to rip it. You know, you see this is still the rubber dam. Um, there's no trickery here, but it creates just a little more space so that I don't have to worry about there being a, you know, green piece of latex in my composite. <laughs> so going in here now, clear fill, um, still have to run through these bottles uh, before I get to try my new stuff, but I am excited for it. Hopefully it'll make a difference. Um, I don't think it'll save a ton of time because it's still a separate bond and or prime and bond, which I do believe has been shown to be the best as far as all around bonding strength. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued to see what it works. Hopefully it'll work out really nicely there. So going in and what you want to do when you fill these, uh, sometimes if it's, especially if it's a younger patient, this was, this patient was a little bit older. So there was some calcification underneath that truss. You can actually get a composite to go underneath that truss, which makes it look amazing, obviously. <laughs> so it's not something that works every single time. And it works a lot better on younger patients because they haven't had as much calcification, but you can get it. This is also a case where amalgam works incredibly well. Composite does not compress. You can't compress composite. So with amalgam, you can actually get really good fill underneath that truss. Unfortunately, most general dentists these days don't really love amalgam, which, you know, does break my heart. Um, I just bought a, I think enough amalgam to last me for the rest of my career. <laughs> so I, I, at this point I do amalgam on friends and family members and to close up gold crowns. Unfortunately, everything else is a bonded composite. Still a great material, but everybody likes prepping on composite more, which I do get. Composite's easier to prep on. It doesn't leave amalgam shards everywhere. So I get it, but I still have a special place in my heart for amalgam. So going to smooth everything out here with the Glick, just like we would normally um, clean up everything. Um, and you'll notice that Buckle Pit, did it have carries? No. Would it be a big deal? No. However, I have had a few times where the Buckle Pit did have some decay that I wasn't aware of. I left it and got a nasty call from the dentist. So my recommendation is if you're going to be trusted to do the restorative, take out everything, give them a nice clean surface to start with here. You'll notice I did a longer cure on this one. Whenever it's this large amount of composite, I like to do two 20 second cures, one buckle, one lingual, just to help make sure we have a complete set. This is built as a dual clear material. It will set up eventually. Um, it takes a little bit it's a pretty quick setup, actually. It, to, to, to full hardness will take uh, probably six minutes, I want to say. Um, and you'll start to see here as I'm doing my final cleanup, when I go down to do the actual prep, it's still soft. And so what you can do is go back in for another 20 seconds right on that area to make sure it hardens up nicely. And now it actually is hard. You'll actually feel when you put the diamond into that, or the burr into that, it's soft. And you don't want that to be the case. So going through here doing my prep. And in this case, normally I like to leave everything flush. You have all seen me do this in a couple of the restorative cases just for the gingiva. In his case, he's already had everything cleaned out and the gums were healthy. They had healed up to the point that they're going to be where they're going to be. So what I did here to make the general dentist life a little bit easier is put in a tiny margin. Um, nothing super extensive, anything like that, but enough that I they'll be able to tell where it is because it is pretty far down. Uh, it's probably 10, 12 millimeters down. That's a long way to be able to prep without having the help of a microscope. You can see I'm hitting the rubber dam. It's, you know, <laughs> I like to do as much as possible with it on. However, sometimes when that burr hits it, it'll just start to cause issues. But if you look at the mirror, I'm getting some pretty clear uh, connection there between the tooth and the composite itself. Unfortunately, that rubber dam piece is getting in my way. So I'm going to go ahead and just pop this off here. The rubber dam at this point, you can see it, it's trying to escape. <laughs> it's had enough. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and pop this off, finish up. This patient was super compliant, very easy. His tongue was cooperative, lips weren't bad. So nice guy, um, easy to take this sealed up. Sometimes with these large cases like this, I'll actually turn the diamond sideways to create just a little bit 
bit more some the if you keep it vertical you have more of a risk of gouging and so you'll see me here just to polish everything and keep it looking nice so that it's hygienic I'll turn it sideways and actually clean off the remaining composite there um, you want to make sure that especially on these deep cases and if the dentist is trusting you that like that the, the sideways kind of what I was talking about if the dentist is trusting you to do the restorative you want to do it pretty much better than them um, that's that's the key to getting the approval of doing restorative is to be extremely good at it and make their lives easy. Don't send back something that has voids. Don't send back something that's going to cause them to need more time. That has been my one of the biggest practice builders is doing beautiful restorative. I don't think all my restorative is beautiful, but I keep it. That's the I, I strive for perfection, and hopefully we'll get good enough along the way. And you'll kind of see here what I'm going to do. This is where I was deciding if I want to keep it flush or not. Because the gingiva was healthy, even up against that IRM with that open area, I'm highly confident we're not going to see a lot of, you know, creep up onto the actual margin itself. So I'm going to go in here. Uh, you can see assistants coming in now with the air to keep that area dry. I'm prepping dry at this point. Um, really light brushes. And just doing maybe a millimeter of a margin you'll see it in the final film here in just a second but it really does make it a lot easier for them so that's kind of what it looks like you can see that we have about a millimeter of two structure down there and that's what it looks like on the final x-ray you can see the space for biologic width uh, which you know isn't really a thing but really pleased with how this one turned out let me know if you guys have done truss cases in the past i think it's a nice technique to help conserve tooth structure um you just help make sure that this tooth is as strong as possible because if you were to drill one huge hole there it really would destroy so much of the tooth. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. As always, if you have any comments, questions, drop them below, and I will talk to you next time.